samples for rolling resistance on given materials, and it's all over the place. It could be rather uh, light pole for something on concrete or something much heavier pole if you're in sand. I threw a number here as 0.04. That's like if you're on sand, so it's going to be a high number for you. So now for the second step, assuming the rolling resistance is 0.04, we're going to take the cosine of that angle times the 300 pounds of weight times 0.04. That's the coefficient of rolling resistance. That gives you 12 pounds. That's to overcome that part of it. Now, if you're going uphill, you would add those two numbers to get a total of 21. And obviously, it will be different if you're on concrete or different types of materials. So again, take the sine of the angle times the load. You'll get the pull for gravity. The cosine of the angle times the load times the coefficient of rolling resistance. You'll get the uh, rolling resistance. Add them for going uphill. Subtract downhill. At any point, guys, stop me along the way you'd like. If you have a question, don't wait until the end. Just uh, stop and I'll answer it for you. Okay, once we have the pole, oh, by the way, if you had a scale and you could hook a light rope onto the front of the bike and the person can balance, you could go along and pull them and read the scale. That would be the most accurate reading of all because then you know exactly the rolling resistance and your drawbar pull. So now we're going to try and find the torque. The torque is nothing but radius times pull. If you were working in metric, it would be Newton meters times are the meters time into you. Okay, let's assume your bicycle wheel is 28 inches in diameter. Your pole is 21 inches. Now, to get the torque, we need the radius. So 28 divided by 2, this is 14, times 21 pounds of pull, gives us 294 pound inches of torque. Many times you guys would call that inch pounds, but technically it's pound inches. Okay, moving forward a little bit. Next is system pressure. System pressure is a common denominator to all the components in your system. Typically, what we have to do is look at the kind of components we look at or want to use, and the weakest component, which has the lowest pressure, is what our system pressure must be under. We cannot go over the pressure of any components rating that the manufacturer puts out. In addition to that, you probably don't want to work that high. If I were to take 6,000 PSI motor and run it, at 6,000 PSI, you would find that my volumetric efficiency is probably falling off a little bit. Mechanical would be good. Volumetric would be a little lower than you would maybe want. That is slippy. You'd be pedaling a little more and back wheel would be slipping just a little bit. On the contrary to that, let's say that you had a high pressure motor and you only worked at 500,000 PSI. The motor would be so tight and the pump would be so tight that you'd have a low mechanical efficiency, which means it would pedal hard for what you're getting out of it. So what you're looking for is a sweet spot, someplace in between. So if you're gonna work at a thousand PSI or something like that, you might want a pump and a motor that are rated for maybe 1500 overboard with it, or it's gonna pedal hard and it's gonna be a lot more work. Okay, and again, here's a little comment. Working pressures or pressures manufacturers comfortably have their components work at for safety reasons and efficiencies. Here's some similarities. For you that might have an electrical background, pressure, which we typically in engineering terms use as P, this is PSI. And that's the same as voltage, and their letter we normally use is E for mode of force. Usually expressed in engineering true, I call that gallons per minute or liters per minute. And flow in electrical system which is labeled I, which actually stands for intensity. In electricity, we have voltage is equal to current times resistance. Here we would have pressure is equal to flow times the constant. We typically don't talk about hydraulics in that respect as they do in electricity, but that's what it would be. 
if you wanted to match up this similar terminology there. Okay, our next slide here is to determine the drive motor. What size motor do we need? Notice I'm starting at the load and not at the pump. We're gonna figure out what we need to do the job here. Torque, and here's a formula for hydraulics, is CIR. CIR is a cubic inches per revolution that a motor or a pump requires to turn the output shaft one turn. It doesn't make any difference if it's a gear pump or a vane pump or a piston pump or a rotor motor, whatever. It's the amount of oil to make the shaft turn one turn. The um, acronyms of uh, CIR are identical to CID, cubic inch displacement, DISP, which stands for displacement, CIPR, cubic inches per rev. They're all exactly the same. I'm using the acronym here, CR, cubic inches per rev. <laughs> and in this case, pressure is something that you as a designer have to come up with. You're kind of thinking in the back of your mind, what components do I want to use? The pressure is going to be common through all the high pressure components. Just like electricity, you wire a room, everything's 110 volts. So you're going to wire the room for 110 and all your appliances will work off of 110. Okay, so using the formula here, we had 294 pound inches of torque required in our previous calculation. And if you take the cubic inches per rev times a thousand PSI, that is going to be divided by 6.28. That's 2 pi. Okay. And that gives us a 1.85 cubic inch per rev motor. Do I have a question here? Anybody have a question at this point? thought I heard something. Okay. So this is theoretically the motor I would need would be one that took 1.85 cubic inches to turn over every single turn. Now hydraulic motors typically have a volumetric and a mechanical efficiency. In reality, they vary a little bit from one brand, uh, type of motor to another. I threw in 90% right here for a hydraulic motor. Now what that means is if I had, if I slip 90%, and that's more than you're gonna slip, you're not gonna slip 10% uh, on these hydraulic motors at the pressures you're working with. But if you did, or if you turned a gear pump real slow, you would have a little more slippage, but here's an efficiency of 90%. So watch what I do. I take the 1.85 and over here, I'm gonna up it to 2.09. I'm gonna divide by 0.9. Just put that in the back of your mind and put it on hold for a minute. That's where that number is coming from. So let me go back here. RPM. Here's a formula that comes in real handy. When I started teaching, I didn't have a formula. I had to calculate it the long way, and I made up this formula. 336 times miles per hour divided by the diameter of the wheel. That's constants from all the adjustments from inches in diameter to revolutions per minute change to rest miles per hour and all that. So there's a constant, nice, simple formula you can always use. By the way, if you don't have miles per hour that you want to move and you have feet per second, then this number would be 229. 229 times feet per second divided by wheel diameter. We'll give you RPM. So substituting in 336 times, let's say, 10 miles an hour divided by 28 inch wheel. That's not the rim diameter, that's the actual rolling diameter. It would be equal to 120 RPM. Then I go over here and here's the formula for gallons per minute. That's the cubic inches in one revolution times the number of revolutions per minute will give me cubic inches per minute. And then there's 231 cubic inches to a gallon. So if I take this multiplication of the product, those two, and divide by 231, I now have converted cubic inches per minute into gallons per minute. And using that a little bit larger displacement, figuring a little bit of inefficiency here, I plugged in 2.05 times 120 RPM divided by 231, we need to pump 100 or 1.06 gallons per minute out of the pump. That's a pretty low flow in hydraulic systems, but this is a pretty low horsepower too. Any questions? 
If anyone has a question, they can um, type it on, under the question in, as well, and then we can we can let Ernie know. I have a question. Need diameter? How so? Well, you're rolling on the outside of the tires. So what you really want to do is measure from the center of the axle to the ground and double it. And that's your rolling diameter. See, the rim is a little smaller, and you actually will be moving a little bit faster with the tire on the rim than if you ran without a tire at all on the rim. And the same way when you're calculating torque, your true radius is from the center of the axle to the ground. There's a flat spot in the bottom of that tire, and that throws your calculations off just a little bit. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Next slide. Let's look at horsepower here. Now, back here, I use 1.06 gallons per minute. And I was just doing a horsepower calculations to do a little comparison here. So I upped this by another 0.95, excuse me, 0.95. So I took the GPM that we had from the previous page, 1.06, divided by 0.95. This is for the pump. See, I'm giving you a little different efficiency in the pump. The pump's going to slip just a little bit too. So now, theoretically, I'm trying to pump 1.12 gallons per minute, just a tad more. And I'm going to pump it at 1,000 pounds of pressure resistance divided by the constant of 1714 means that it would take 0.65 horsepower to go up that 3% um, grade, which is a fairly good grade on an interstate. That's all the higher uh, cars can go without a truck lane. If you're going up a long hill and you go over 3% grade, the uh, interstate requires a truck lane. So that's a pretty good grade. Six, uh, 0.65 horse. Now, if I go to the torque formula and calculate horsepower torque, which was 2, uh, 294 times 120 RPM divided by 63025, this is a constant for inch pounds. If you're dealing with pound feet or foot pounds, it's 5252. But you do the calculation, it comes up to 0.56 horse. So I took the 0.56. And threw in my inefficiencies of 0.9 and my 0.95. That's where I jumped it from 0.56 theoretical to 0.65 actual horsepower. A lot of times when I do calculations, I do the whole thing on a theoretical basis and I throw inefficiencies at the end. Makes the calculations a little bit easier and you don't get stumped along the way of, hey, how, how come the numbers are always changing a little bit? But this is the correct way of working at it. Okay. Once we have that flow, it's important to size lines. And plumbing is extremely important. If you undersize a line, you're going to have excess pressure drop, and you're going to have a high velocity. And that's going to take some extra uh, effort on your part to push it. Um, it's like an extension cord. If you have a long, skinny extension cord, Let's say you have a one horse electric motor and you plug it into a 50 foot long 14 gauge extension cord. That motor, if even without a load on, will take a couple of seconds to get up to speed. You'll hear it kind of kick in. It won't be an instantaneous as it would be without that long extension cord. And for our velocities, which is a little different, you know, electrons, they go through wires 186,000 miles a second for oil. What we typically would use. It's one of our standards. Uh, one of them, the ISO standard, is 16 feet per second for a pressure line. It drops down to eight feet on a return line and not more than four feet per second in an inlet. American National Standards Institute uses 20 feet per second for pressure and not more than five. That's the one I typically use personally, but I do the calculations to make sure I'm always under 20 feet per second. And this is... Um, and SAE, and this is, does not affect you, but for closed loop hydrostatics, it goes as high as 25 feet a second. What's really critical here is inlet. Uh, for you, because you're working a little flows, it's not super critical, but the best thing is not to use any elbows or restrictions within the last 10 diameters of the inlet to the pump. This means that your inlet hose, if it were one inch diameter, you would not want to be any closer than 10 inches to the pump. 
a three eighth inch intake hose, you want to stay away three and three quarter inches. So you get nice laminar flow in the pump. And again, when you're working really slow like this, this isn't going to affect you quite as much, but it's just good practice of this. What I typically would use is the bulkhead going in the reservoir and then inside the reservoir, I use a short piece of tubing with a, and I flare the end of it. So that's your pickup tube. So you get a nice full tube of oil. And from that reservoir going to the pump, I usually go hoses. And the reason for the hose is the hose is measured by the ID where a piece of tubing is measured by the OD. Okay, if you have a lightning reference, you can go to page 114 on the revision eight and 115 and it has charts right there for you that you can look at. They also have up in the right hand corner, if you have one, you can look and watch the plumbing when you go through a sharp 90 degree corner. A 90 degree elbow has three times the pressure drop that going straight through a T or through a straight hose does. So when you plumb something, kind of keep in mind that you don't want a lot of kinks in it and uh, you want a nice uh, uh, laminar flow. Here's the formula for uh, calculating velocity of oil in feet per second. It's 0.32 times our gallons per minute divided by the net area of the hose. You figure out your feet per second that you want to run, and you can take 0.32 times GPM divided by that, and you'll have the net area. Again, if the ID, if you're measuring on a hose, the ID is your net area. Now, you have to convert that back to diameter. So just playing with this, if this were... Um, 10 feet per second you were running at. Again, I'm trying to be a little different than actual numbers. 0.32, and I don't say I'm going to take two gallons a minute, just to be different, times two divided by 10. That would give me an area of 0.064. Then I would need to work backwards with either pi r squared or I use diameter squared times 0.7854 to truly calculate the ID. So here's your formula. I think you're capable of doing that. Note in this case, for that low flow, a one quarter inch hose is big enough for your pressure line. Quarter inch hose Ernie, is big enough. Yep. Ernie, I have a question when, whenever you have a okay. second. Go ahead, go ahead. We are limited to only a certain size hose with using the component menu. That size is number six. Any okay. changes? a different size if we calculate we need a larger size? Nope, you're good. You're good because a 3 8 hose, I'm going to get to that 3 8 hose is a number six hose and that's big enough for your inlet. So your pressure lines can be 3 8 They can be bigger. Just don't go any smaller. So 3 8 is going to be just fine. And again, six, a number six is six sixteenths of an inch. A dash eight hose is eight sixteenths of an inch, which is a half an inch. A quarter inch hose would be a dash four hose. So you're good with that. You, if they've got three eighth inch hoses, you're more than ample. A three eighth inch hose will take 6.8 gallons of in, and that's way over what they're going to be doing. Does that answer okay. that? What if we calculate we need number 16? You said that is not on the component menu. Uh, you're going to have uh, something much bigger than a gorilla pedaling that bike if you need to get up to 16. One gallon a minute at 1,500 PSI is a horsepower. And uh, in order to get up to 16, a dash 16 in a, uh, is good for 49 gallons a minute. And so there's no way they're going to need a one-inch hose. 49 gallons a minute is 20 feet per second for a one-inch hose. So From that's why accumulator I, to pump only during the whole drag thing, rate. The whole thing is going to be under a three-eighths-inch hose because if you dump that kind of flow, you'd be taken off. You'd literally be taken off for space if you dump that much oil through the system because it would – the accumulator, they have to restrict it back and they're going to hold it back by the acceleration of the bike and maybe a flow control. So, no, even going into the accumulator, three quarter, a three eighths inch hose is going to be plenty big for whatever they're doing. There isn't enough, we don't want that much horsepower coming out of that accumulator. We're going to be burning the back tire. 
if you look at that small displacement, and just to give you an example, if you were only pumping 10 gallons a minute, and I'm going to multiply that by 231 and divide by 1.85 cubic inches, you would be turning the back tire at 1247 RPM, 1248 RPM. So that's why I'm saying three eighths inches more than enough. I think Bill and I had talked about that when we decided what kind of hose they need for the job. So I, last year I saw some bigger hoses. And they're harder to bend. They're harder to work with. So this will be plenty and your velocities will be way, way down. So nothing to fear, students. Nothing to fear on that. If the ports are bigger on your accumulator and on your pump and motor, you can step them down to that size. Only the inlet really needs to be up to three eighths, but if you want to do the whole system in three eighths or whatever, you're welcome to do it. That works fine. Okay, hope that answers that. Now we're gonna size the pump, okay? Sizing the pump, we had the 1.06 GPM. Notice I went back to the 1.06. Before when I did that calculation, I figured in the pump too. When I added that last 0.95, I'm going to do that at the bottom of the slide. So I'm going to start with the 1.06 that we really needed coming out of the pump. And I'm working the equation here backwards, GPM times 231 divided by RPM. And what's the RPM? I use the number 60 for pedal speed. I've always kind of calculated one revolution a minute for pedal speed. Some people like to go a little bit higher. Maybe you want to pedal at 75 or 80 RPM and pedal a little bit easier. Then plug in that number. The faster you pedal, the smaller the CIR will be in that pump. And so I calculated here 1.4 or 4.1 CIR, adding the volumetric inefficiency. I divided that number by that and I came up with a number of 4.3 CIR. Now, moving forward here, I threw in a little bit more with the overall efficiency. Volumetric efficiency is the slippage. Mechanical efficiency is the friction and pressure drop through the components. If you multiply the two together, you have overall efficiency. And I talk here a little bit about Quite often, it cal uh, work everything at 100% and then divide by the efficiencies later on. It makes it a little bit easier math, but either works. And here's a math check for you. If the wheel is turning 120 and the pedal 60, I need a two to one step up. That would be theoretical. If you add in the inefficiencies, then the pump will be more than twice as big as the uh, hydraulic motor, the pump being attached to your pedals. Now, if you notice, students, when you look at this RPM, pedaling 60 RPM, if you've done any of your homework at this point, and you start looking up a gear pump, they don't like pumping below a couple hundred RPM. They slip. And if you pump, uh, turn gear pumps too slow, the efficiency really falls in the toilet. And so that's why this year we've allowed you to use a chain. Last year you had to gear it up with a couple of gears and you'd put a big gear on the pedal and a little gear driving the pump and that can still work just fine. But we gave you the option of connecting the pedals to a pump with a chain and we gave you the option of connecting the hydraulic motor to the back wheel with a chain. Mounting a motor in the back wheel isn't exactly easy. And if a chain is an option for you, you can so do it. And here's one of the advantages with the chain is that you can speed up the pump by putting a big sprocket on your pedals and a small one on the pump. And then you can get by with a smaller CIR of your pump. Smaller CIR means a lighter pump. Same thing with the motor in the back end. You can change your speed ratio with your sprockets so that the motor speed is not necessarily one-to-one -to, -one to the wheel speed, and therefore, again, maybe get by with a smaller motor, which is also lighter weight. So that's giving you some extra options. Sometimes with uh, gears, it's a little bit hard to do. Here you can do that. So, And CID to CID works just like number of teeth to number of teeth. If you have twice the CID at the pump that you do as a motor, that would be like having a sprocket twice as big on the pedal as you do on the back wheel. 
that kind of wraps up my presentation. Uh, you're more than welcome to contact me, or if you've got some math and you want me to check it before you uh, start purchasing everything, feel free to do that. And we'll be happy to check out your math and tell you what you're doing, because we want all these machines to be working. We want it to be your design, but we do want them working. And when you get there to Dan Foss, you've got a machine you're proud of, and something that you can show us that is working. Any questions? I have one. If you guys have questions, you can um, either unmute mute your phone, or there is a button that says raise your hand if you can't unmute yourself, and we can try and unmute on this end as well. Oh, I heard a question. Go ahead. Yeah. Is there any information about cylinder? Can you on help? cylinders? Yes. Ash. I could help you with that. If you take, um, are you looking at how to size a cylinder? Yes. Okay, we have a formula that works very well with cylinders. It's force is equal to pressure times area. Force is equal to pressure times area. For example, if you had a two inch diameter cylinder and you calculate the area of that, that would be 3.14 square inches. Then, if you take the stroke of the cylinders, it's eight inches long, 3.1419, if you want to carry it out, times eight is 25.13 cubic inches per stroke. That is when you're retracting the cylinder. If you're doing it both ways, pushing and pulling, what you have to do is take the area of the cylinder minus the area of the rod and use that as your effective area for the rod end and then multiply it by the stroke. So that gives you basically a cubic inches per cycle. You follow me? So whether you're doing it only on the push or only on the pull or both ways. Go ahead. Can you say what's uh, the, how you divide the cubic inches again? The you're taking the area of the cylinder, the di inside uh -huh. diameter of the cylinder, take the area times the stroke of the cylinder. Area times length is volume. And volume is your cubic inches per we don't call it cubic oh, okay. inches per rev, it's just called cubic inches per cycle. Okay, okay. And then you could apply that to the hydraulic motor. See, I pushed that cylinder once, I've got 25 cubic inches, and if I had a five cubic inch motor, just pushing on that cylinder once would make the motor turn over five turns. Okay, all right. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. You're welcome. Anybody else? Pretty quiet on the other end there. How many schools do we have listening today, Lynn? It's hard to say, but we have 25, uh, 22. 22 participants. It's by but, individual. Sure. Well, I guess I'm ready to turn it back to you and over to Bill. Well, thank you, Ernie. Mm -hmm. I'll stay on the line. All right. Our next presenter is Bill Hotchkiss, and he is the technical training manager at SunSource. Bill has been a wealth of uh, information and help for us in getting the component menu um, and just organized getting everything organized and ready for all of you to, to start ordering components and working. So I'll turn it over to Bill. Afternoon, everybody. Uh, I did click on show my screen. So are you seeing uh, my screen now? Yes. Excellent. All right, I thought we'd kind of go over some of the products that we're offering uh, first and and we'll go through a couple of uh, other items that will be critical uh, for you folks. So as Ernie said, uh, we're going to offer 3 8 hose assemblies, single wire. So easier to bend than double wire. You've got at least 2,500 PSI working pressure and probably more like uh, 10,000, 9,000 bursts. So we should uh, have plenty of safety factor in whatever you're doing. 
We are going to offer some hosens, one of them being a male JIC, one of them being female JIC straight. And JIC is for Joint Industrial Council. It's a 37 degree flare and they produce a very good seal. Uh, the next option, uh, uh, female swivel, 45 degree bend. And the final 90 degree bend, female swivel, all three eighths. Some additional adapters to help you along with the hose assemblies, and we're going to talk more about the hose assembly shortly. But a uh, 2070-6-6S would be a uh, 3 8 37 degree male to a female swivel in a 45 degree angle. And if we go on down, uh, 37 degree male to male with a 90 degree bend, and on down to the 2071, 37 degree male to female. And that would be a 90 degree bend to get to your female swivel. You may want to join more than, uh, more than two lines together. So a 2033 would be a 37 degree male T. So male on each of the three uh, ends and a 203101 is a 3H 37 degree T, one female swivel and two males. And finally, you're no doubt going to be dealing with uh, straight thread O ring, what we call SAE, Society of Automotive Engineers. So I gave you an SAE O ring boss male to a 37 degree male uh, JIC, so an adapter. As we move down, we move into some Vickers Valium. So this SV1 here would be a two way, two position, normally closed, and this will have the SAE number six ports. So this adapter right here would uh, screw right into this valve. And this would be 12 volt DC with a 10 connector. So three, three pin prong connector, pretty common, commonly used in mobile type applications. And some teams may want to go with a normally open valve. For, so the second valve in SV3, two-way, two-position, normally open, meaning this valve de-energized passes fluid, whereas the top one, the normally closed, when the, when the coil is de-energized, uh, this blocks flow from the inlet to the outlet. The second one allows flow, and when we energize the coil on number two, it shuts the flow off. When we energize the coil on number one, it opens the flow up. Next guy in red uh, is an EPV10, so a proportional valve, two-way, two-position poppet type, and it is a flow control with the SAE uh, number six ports. So there again, this adapter up here would be a great choice to work in these valves. And this valve uh, with number six ports, so considered a three-eighths valve, it's got a 12-volt coil on it, and flow, uh, let's call it from half a gallon to 10 gallons a minute. And I had that in red because uh, the lead time is a little longer on that guy, up to 55 days. So that could be considered working to so he's got kind of a long lead time. Next guy down, ERV10. This is a proportional pressure control. Happens to be a relief valve. Uh, up to 2,500 PSI and number SAE ports. The MRV3 
is a manual detented rotary type directional control valve. It's actually a three-way three position. So you have three distinct positions and detented means that it locks. So it is going to stay in the position you put it in. Uh, I'm going to give you a link, uh, the last thing we do to the Eaton power source site. And any, any of these can be entered in the search box on the power source site and you will pretty much go straight to the information on, on uh, any of these items. Last guy, a DT8P1, just an inline check valve, five PSI, cracking pressure. So if you, if you need to allow flow going one way, but never want to have the flow going the other way, this guy will accomplish that goal. A couple of uh, four-way valves that we're offering, the DG17V3 with a 2C. Uh, this would be all ports closed, all ports blocked in the center position. And it is a four-way, three-position directional control valve. It is spring-centered. And it also requires a subplate and bolt kit. And here they are. And this, uh, this is a side-ported SAE port subplate and the bolt kit to bolt the valve down to the subplate. So that might be one of the valves that you want to use. The second one uh, is actually a four-way three position with a tandem center. So with this spool, we open up in the center position, we open up pressure to tank, but we block A and B. And then when you energize this valve one way, you will end up going P to A, B to T. And when you energize it the other way, you will go P to B and A to T. So think of a cylinder going back and forth. So in the center position, your pump will be unloaded to tank. Uh, and then when you shift it one way, you extend the cylinder. When you shift it far the other way, you retract the cylinder. Also requires subplate and bolt kit. Sun source is going to, and, and pretty much everything for ply. So, so very generous uh, from all the ball valves, some source has agreed to supply to the teams. So the BBH, 3 eighths inch, 2000 PSI, SAE O-ring threads. So there again, that adapter that we pointed out uh, up top would screw into these ports and would take you right to a number six JIC where you can uh, utilize your hose assemblies. So the BV3D, uh, 3 8 higher pressure rated, and it's also a three-way diverter ball valve. So you, you may want to contact Ernie about, hey, how do, we, uh, how do we tie the accumulator in and make that oil usable to our system? You might want to use that diverter type ball valve. Uh, next guy, BVAL, uh, half inch, 400 PSI. I, I kind of put this in there because uh, you may want to have this on your reservoir as a shutoff between the reservoir and the inlet of the pump. Uh, sometimes ball valves cannot be a full size. If you use a a 3 8 ball valve, it might be a little under 3 8 going through the center. So I just moved it up a size to make sure you had a generous flow on your inlet line. And lastly, uh, a higher pressure 3 8 also three-way diverter valve, but it is different than this diverter valve in that it's got a closed center. These valves right here are DMIC, that is the manufacturer, 
feel free to go to dmic.com uh, to get to uh, to get to their site and view any of these. Uh, SunSource is also going to supply the accumulators this year. These are Accumulators Inc. So if you went to accumulatorsinc.com, you would get to their site. You can plug any of these numbers in. And this first one, an A1PT, you will find is a one pint accumulator, SAE thread. So you can go ahead and use a reducer bushing and bush down to that 3 8 size SAE. The next one is a one quart with a same thread. And the final one is a one gallon, which I'm thinking was going to be probably oversized for your application, but uh, we made it available anyway. Uh, you can also go to Accumulators Incorporated and use some of their formulas. So keep that in mind. Eaton is offering uh, various sizes of gear pumps, three in left-hand rotation, three in right-hand rotation, and three different sizes of gear motors. Uh, these are, are bi-directional, so it doesn't matter. They'll rotate either clockwise or counterclockwise efficiently. As Ernie pointed out, the uh, gear products, uh, have some efficiency issues, and this is what we can offer. I, I will leave it at that. If you choose to use something else, uh, that would be up to you. So that's kind of a components list. If we go to the ordering form, uh, you can see for product-related questions, you can email me, that's fine. For application questions, con please contact Ernie. To order, where you're going to send your order is to Denise Parr. And here is her email address. So we kind of have a, a, a form to follow here, so your order date, name, department, email for a contact, phone number for a contact, the school, your ship to address, and here is for pumps and motors. You can go here. I did not actually put these maximums in here. If somebody wants to go beyond, shoot me an email, or if it's just like one piece, or if you want three instead of two, uh, just go ahead and order them. Accumulators, too. I would hope you would not need more than two accumulators. Hoses, we'll talk about in a minute. And I roll this down. Valves, uh, go ahead and list your directional valves. If you want a check valve, if you want to uh, put your subplate and, and bolt kit in here as well. So let's see, fittings, uh, list your fittings you want and the quantities you want, and miscellaneous items. Uh, not sure what we were going to go in there, but that's available. And let's see, as far as hose assemblies, uh, you would put your team, your school in there, your phone number, the individual that's actually ordering at the individual's phone number, cell, or whatever, uh, your ship to address, uh, the date you're sending this into Nace, uh, you know, date response required by, I just put three days out, something like that. So we are offering 3 8 hose, a uh, single wire, should be a perfect fit for your applications. You know, if you want a 24 inch hose, just go ahead and put in 24 inches. Uh, if you want 12 inches, do that. 36, do that. Uh, we've got some hose ends in here. And actually, uh, let me get that out of there. 
because when you want to put your end connections in here, you're going to click on that box and you're going to come over and you're going to use the drop down box. If you want uh, male JIC ends, click on that and it fills it in. If you want something different, uh, click that in. If you if you want a male GAC on one end and and a female GAC swivel 45 degree, uh, mm -hmm. I see we didn't really leave a provision for doing that. So what you're going to do is you're just going to add it out here to the right. Make make one hose end uh, and type it in if it's different than the one in the box. Assuming you're all using petroleum-based fluid, and I'm pretty sure that that is the case. And one final thing for me, and Lynn, I'm not sure, do we have this site listed on the NFPA site? Because I've been contacted uh, by one team, and they indicated that this was not listed on the NFPA site for them, but this is the address that you would go to to uh, get technical information on any of those Eaton valves, whether it be the two-way two position or the four-way three position valves uh, on the hose, on the hose ends, on the fittings, anything Eaton, which is everything but ball valves and accumulators, you would go to this site, and you can get a ton of information from this site. Bill, I think I thought it was on there, but I'll check, and if not, I'll we'll get it up there. Great. So, are there any questions for me? All right, well, if there are no questions, there we go. oh, there's a question. Hold on, someone typed okay. in a question. Okay. Are we limited on where we are allowed to purchase parts such as pumps and motors? Also, are we limited on sizes we are allowed to use? You are only limited by what I have to offer here uh, I'm not saying you can't use anything else in the world, but but I'm limited to offering you these components. So if, if you want something outside of this, uh, I would say there's no limitation. But I can't supply them outside of this list. Right, that would be at your own cost. Correct. Ernie, are you still on the line? I am. One of the other One questions the other was, are we limited on the sizes we are allowed to use? No, I agree 100% with Bill. They can do whatever they want to do. It's just they're going to have to pay for it on their own. We've okay, come up great. with the most practical sizes for them, but if they want to go bigger and real low flow, they're welcome to do that. Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions? All right, if not, well, thank you to everyone. We had a really great group, but uh, many thanks to Ernie and to Bill also for presenting this information. Um, Ernie and Bill, if I can get, or especially Ernie, get your presentation, I will definitely put that up on the website. And we started, we recorded it. We started a little bit late on the recording, but we will put the recording up on the website for others that want to listen as well. Good. All right. Well, thanks again to everyone. And uh, again, let us know if you have any questions.